Acts chapter 22, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God, as you all are today. And so we're going to be looking at a testimony, the power of a testimony. Now, some people have yet to have a testimony because they're not saved. And you may not understand what we're looking at today, but I would ask you to give a listen and, and to grow to understand a little bit about the power of what is called a testimony. Now, I want to lay the foundation here by reminding us of a few things. Remember, when Jesus Christ had prepared his men for ministry, he had taught them to expect resistance. He had made it very clear they're about to enter into spiritual warfare. They're going to enter in to hostile territory. And as they enter into this kind of territory, this opposition, that they are to expect rejection, even persecution. Now, the reason that they would be rejected, the reason that they would encounter persecution is because they're giving a message, a message that is resisted by Satan. It's a message called the gospel, a message of freedom from sin and freedom from bondage. And as messengers of this gospel, they're entering in to hostile territory, to enemy territory. When John was writing, the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, this is what he wrote. He said, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And so they're embarking on a rescue mission to set free those who have been taken captive by Satan. And the message that they're going to bring is going to be the message that rescues them because it's a message that opens the spiritually blind eyes of the prisoners. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 said, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Jesus knew that the enemy would not let go of his prisoners easily. He had said in Luke chapter, chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, he had said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. He said, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. So he's preparing his men for the attacks from the enemy. And he's saying it, when you take this message out into this hostile environment that is under the control, the sway of the evil one, Satan, expect persecution as a price for preaching the gospel. He said in Matthew 10, you'll be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who perseveres to the end, he said, will be saved. So rejection and even persecution is part of the price for preaching this message of salvation. When we rely on the Lord, then what happens is he will give us the strength that we need. He'll give us the words that we need to speak. In Luke 12, 11 and 12, he said, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities. Do not worry about how or what you should answer or, or what you should say. He went on to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you want to say. So Paul was prepared. The Spirit had given him words of preparation for the suffering that he's going to endure. Earlier in, in chapter 20 of the book of Acts, he had said in verses 22 and 23, he had said, See, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. He said, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. And so he knew he was going to suffer many things for the name of Christ, and, and, and these are the things that can happen when you want to live for Christ. It's part of the cost that we need to be willing to pay as we go on this rescue mission. Somebody said suffering for Christ's sake is to be viewed as a privilege. As God has bestowed the gift of salvation, so he has also bestowed 
the gift of suffering. Where would you get that idea from? Well, Philippians 1.29, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. And so Paul was ready to do that, and Paul is experiencing what he's been prepared for. Now, last time we were together, when, uh, when he was in the temple, he had been falsely accused of bringing into the temple a Gentile. That was an offense worthy of death. And a crowd had set upon him in order to kill him. They had thought that he had brought a Gentile into areas that were prohibited to the Gentile. Now, there was a sign, I mentioned this to you, that, that was placed in the court of the Gentiles. That was the only place a Gentile could go into. It was four different courtyards. The court of the Gentiles, the Gentiles could enter in, but they could not enter in any further than that. And there was a sign that said, no Gentile may enter within the screen and the enclosure around the temple. Whoever shall be caught doing so shall be responsible for his own death, which follows. Well, they had seen him there with a man by the name of Trophimus, who was an Ephesian, and, and, and they said, he's brought a Gentile into the, into the temple, and, and it was a, a near riot ensued. And, and as that happened, the, the commander had, had come intervening and rescued Paul. And, and the violence was so great that, that Paul had to be carried by soldiers. And when he was about to go into the barracks, he had begged for permission to speak. Now, the commander had thought he was an Egyptian leader of 4,000 assassins. But after discovering who he was, he gave him permission to address the crowd, and, and that's where we're picking up our, our study. Now, in verse 40 of chapter uh, 21, it says, uh, when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs, motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, brethren and fathers, Hear my defense before you now. Now, Paul begins what is called an ad a defense. And I want you to notice, and I'm going to develop this with you. I want you to, to notice that it was, uh, uh, it was a defense that was given with respect to those who were listening. In other words, he respectfully is asking them to hear him as he speaks. He says in verse 1, uh, uh, of chapter 22, hear my defense. Now, I mentioned to you last, last time we were together that the word defense is a Greek word. The New Testament is written in what is called koine or common Greek. And so the word defense is a Greek word, apologia. It's where you get the word apologetics from. Apologetics is a reasoned statement or an argument concerning Christian doctrine. And so he's giving an, a, a reasoned statement of the things he most surely believes. He's giving a defense of the gospel. And he's about to answer the charges that have been brought against him. And he's using his circumstances as his opportunity to preach the gospel to them. You know, we see that various times in Scripture, how something is happening and is used as a platform for preaching. And Jesus is going through a place called Samaria, as he's entering into this region called Samaria, he's by a well. It's the well of Sychar. And as he's there by this particular well, a woman comes with a water pot. We all know the story. And as she approaches to draw some water and it's noontime and all, Jesus begins to speak to her concerning a need for water. And he uses that particular instance in her life, a circumstance, so that he can preach the message of salvation to her. God will give us opportunities in circumstances, something that's happening sometimes in the ordinary way of life, where we're able to begin to share. And that's what's taking place here. Paul is using the circumstances to give him an opportunity to preach the message of the gospel. Now, they have given charges against him. He saw him in chapter 21, verse 28. They had said that he spoke against the Jews, the law, as well as the temple. So he's about to refute those charges. But first, he wants to share concerning his miraculous conversion. He's about to preach the gospel to his people. And these are people that he loves deeply. So when you share, when you give your testimony, when you witness... Witnessing doesn't begin with the desire to win an argument. There are so many who, who want to win arguments. You can, you can win an argument and still lose 
a person. When I was a young believer, I, I didn't know that, so I studied up on things, and, and then I would approach those who held certain beliefs with an argumentative heart. And, and the Lord said to me, as in an earlier days, he said, you may possibly win an argument, but you're losing the person with your attitude. You see, witnessing doesn't begin with a desire to win an argument. It doesn't begin with the desire to impress people with your eloquence or your intelligence. And, and, and witnessing and giving testimony isn't rooted in anger towards the loss for ruining everything you like, which I think is happening a lot today. We're angry at the people who have ruined this wonderful nation and all of that. Well, it doesn't begin there with anger. It doesn't begin that way at all. It begins with a concerned and loving heart because those who are doing such things are lost. And you see that in Scripture. Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, and it's on uh, Palm Sunday. And Luke tells us something as he's approaching the city when he says in Luke 19, verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. The heart of evangelism begins with a heart that's broken. The heart of evangelism isn't going to be found in the anger we feel about how things are, though I think there's a time for righteous anger, of course. But the heart of evangelism is rooted in a broken heart because the people who are doing such things don't know the Lord and thus are doing things to fulfill whatever desires they may have that they think may make them fulfilled or make them happy. The heart of giving a testimony, the heart of a witness, begins by being broken. In Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6, the psalmist said, Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. It's seen that something is going to take place like when Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem, if you'd have only known this your day, the moment of your visitation, and now things will be destroyed because you rejected the one who came bringing peace. Back in ancient history moment here for you, 2004, there was a, a tsunami. All of us were aware of it, those of us who were alive at that time and aware of things going on in the world. There was a tsunami and and, and part of that, that uh, tsunami affected uh, Thailand. And uh, I had the opportunity with others to go to uh, a place called Phuket in Thailand and to scout it out and to see the damage. And then we were involved in helping to, to, uh, to restore and, and, and to do work and to plant churches, to plant ministries there. And this fellowship back then in 2004, without me ever receiving an offering, I just simply said, if you want to help those people, we received in today's dollars about a quarter million dollars in three, three weeks. Never taking an offering, never receiving an offering. I just said, if it's on your heart. And we were able to do a, a lot of work in Thailand and, and, and all of that. It was terrible. It was a terrible thing. And, and at that time, something was, was uh, circulating a video that I had opportunity to see, and perhaps some of you may, if you cast your memory back there, you might remember it. But there was a man who was on top of a roof as he was watching the wave coming towards the shoreline. And he was yelling at the people who were by the shore. And he was yelling because he could see the wave as it was approaching. The people down below could not see it. And he was yelling for them to get off, get off the shore. The wave is coming. The wave is coming. And what happens, and some of you know this, perhaps some don't, tsunami waves can travel in open sea up to 500 miles an hour. They're not just going like the waves we see in Huntington or wherever. These are 500 mile an hour, 30 plus feet, a wave that can outrun jets. There have been reports of people in commercial jets as they're coming and a tsunami is, is, uh, is moving that is outrunning the jet itself. That's how fast they go. And when they hit the shore, it's not some, some small wave. It's a 30-foot wave that's 
building up in intensity so when it hits the shore, everything that is in its path is churned. You, you, you're, you're, it's like being dropped into, into a, a incinerator, you used to call them, into whatever that thing is called now, or a blender. I'll use the word blender. All of us know what that is. And you're gone. It's just that fast. And so he's yelling, get off the shore. He's screaming because he sees the, the tsunami. He sees, sees the wave. And you know what happened? When it's about to hit, the water recedes from the shoreline. And builds. That's what it does. And there, were, there was a man, and you can see this as a man who saw all the fish that were left behind as the wave was receding. And he had a basket, and he ran out, and he was picking up all these fish because he sold fish in a market. And he was thinking, what a blessing. Look at all of this. I don't even have to cast a net. And the guy is yelling, and he's saying, get off, get off. And you see people starting to run when the wave hits him. And this is the last you'll ever see of that man. For fish on the sand. Ministers of the gospel will preach like that. They'll say, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What will you give in exchange for your soul? That man was willing to exchange his soul for some fish that he thought was his benefit or his blessing that day. Ministers, Paul is on the roof, looking down, crying to people, danger is coming, judgment is coming. Save yourself. And that's the heart of evangelism. It's a, pa it's a passion. It, it, it's not out of anger. It's out of concern. It, it's a heart that's been broken in Romans 9, 1 through 3, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. Paul wasn't rude. Paul isn't preaching arrogantly. He's not aggressive. He's not belligerent. He's not self-righteous. He's sharing a message, and he's going to do so with respect, humility, as well as passionate urgency. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. And that's what he's doing now. He's, he's showing us how when you give a witness, when you give a testimony, the heart should be broken and the speech should be controlled restraining any anger and anything that could be perceived as arrogance and, and belligerent, belligerence. And so it says, brethren and, and, and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And verse 2, when they, they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our Father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. And so notice it speaks in verse 2 of how he, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Now, as he was doing that, by speaking in Hebrew, he was bypassing their cultural dislike for the Greek language. The Greek language was all over the, the city of Jerusalem and throughout Israel, but the Hebrews preferred Hebrew. And so they don't like that because the Greek language carries with it the connotations of Greek culture. And your language, the words that you choose to use to describe the things you believe in, your language, contain, they're containers that are actually opened up to expose the things that you most surely hold fast to. So the Hebrews preferred the Hebrew language over the Greeks. You remember the Greek language. Remember that, that the first controversy in the church had to do with, with uh, the Greek-cultured Jewish women uh, and the, uh, and the uh, Jewish women themselves who were born and culturally Jewish. It, it was involved over the Hellenization of these Greeks. The Greeks were not received well by the Jews. And so he chooses to use the words that he speaks he chooses to use the words that are Hebrew and not Greek. They had a preference 
of, uh, of Scripture being quoted in Hebrew also and not the Greek. And so what he's doing here is he's speaking a language that the Romans will not necessarily understand. This is a private language, if you will. When I grew up, um, on occasion, when my mom wanted to say something to my brother and me, and I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker, let me say that immediately. I can order in a Mexican restaurant, <laughs> and I can get in trouble. But I'm not fluent. I thought my middle name is Estupido for the longest time, so I'm just <laughs> telling you. But my mom, when she wanted to say something that was kind of private, though we were in public, we knew enough Spanish as children for her to speak to us in Spanish. Why did she do that? Well, she normally wouldn't do that because my mom and dad felt that it was rude to speak a language that others around you couldn't understand. So on occasion, my mother would speak in Spanish to us because she wanted us to know something. And so that made it a private conversation, even though it was open. That's what's happening here. The Romans are there, but they're not understanding the language that Paul is speaking, which immediately connects him with the people that he's addressing. And so he begins by saying, again, in verse 3, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus, a Cilicia, but he was brought up in the city. So as a Jew, he's saying this, and this is important to see how he's beginning his de defense. I, as a Jew, I know better than to bring a Gentile, he's saying, into the temple. Now he's saying that, I'm Jewish, I was raised here, I understand. It's intended to open a door. He's basically saying, I understand, I identify with you, I'm one of you. Now that also answers the charge that he had brought a Gentile into the temple. He's making it very clear, that cannot be true. I was raised here, I understand that. So he's giving his testimony, he's giving a personal testimony. Now, what is a testimony? Well, a testimony is a personal story of the love of God and God's grace to us. A, a testimony is intended to encourage and to inspire, as well as to connect people to the message of salvation. A, a testimony is a witness of God's work in our life. It's a story that's intended to contrast what we were with what we have become by the grace of God. It's a story for the purpose of bringing glory to God and not the sinner. It, it's intended to cause people to desire the one who saves and not to be enthralled by the things you've done. Sometimes when we listen to people's testimonies, you get caught up with all the evil they've done and you, you fail to see the good that God has done. And a testimony is not supposed to exalt the sinner. It's to show how rancid in sin that person was and the grace of God that sets you free from those things. And that's what he's about to do. He's giving a story to contrast what he was to what he has become by the grace of God. In 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 15, he said, I, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. What is a testimony? It gives glory to God. And I want you to notice when he was saying this to Timothy, he said, I was formerly, I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent man. I obtained mercy. You were, but you're not now. Keep that in mind. I was in a sociology class at Cal Poly Pomona. And it happened that I went to the class early and there was another young man there who was with me. This is many years ago now. And so he's seated across from me. Nobody else is in the class. The class hasn't, yet, hasn't begun yet. And he begins to speak to me. And I used to take the opportunity in, in, in circumstances like that to share. And so he says, well, who are you? And this and that. And we began to speak. Again, we're in a sociology class. And, and I gave him my testimony. 
And I shared with him what I was and what I've become. And, and as I'm sharing with him about these things, he says to me, oh, because I was an alcoholic. So I, I told him, I said, yeah, I love to drink. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a social drinker. I was the one who drank and overdrank until I was inebriated. I d didn't even know what it tasted like. I was too busy just drinking. And I shared with him, I, I was an alcoholic. And then I said, I came to faith in Christ. And I am no longer an alcoholic. And he says, oh, I see. Because now he's putting into the things we're learning in the class. And so he says, oh, I see. He said, you had a conversion experience. And I said, conversion experience. I said, what I am is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, I told him, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I said, I haven't been conversion experienced I've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ and see that that's preaching the gospel it's not going by man's way that we like to talk about experiences everybody has their own no this is a born again and that's what Paul is talking about I was once a drunk but I'm not I was once a, I was once a drunk I'm not I was once an angry I'm not I'm none of those things because I'm brand new in Jesus Christ and that's the whole thing we need to understand I was formerly a blasphemer there are people to this day who say well they're born again but they're still an alcoholic no you're not you've been set free in the Lord Jesus Christ his Holy Spirit dwells within you. You are brand new. Identify for what you are, not what you were. And Paul didn't say, I am a blasphemer. He says, I was a blasphemer, but no more. See, that's what it means to be converted. So he's giving his testimony. It magnifies the grace of God, and it gives him an opening to share. He wants to share the loving grace of God to these spiritually lost people. So he says in verse 3, he was born in Cilicia, but he was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. So what are you saying, Paul? Well, in his testimony, he is saying, I am not an outsider. There are those who say, well, he doesn't value Israel. He doesn't value Jerusalem. So he's saying, though, though I haven't been born in Israel, I was brought up in Israel. As a matter of fact, verse 3, my parents loved their faith and they even had me tutored by, by Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was one of the most respected Pharisaic rabbis. It's giving an insight into his conservative training. He intends to silence those who had said that he spoke against Moses and the temple. And it also gives us insight into why he speaks to them in the Hebrew language. He wants to identify with them, helping them to realize that he understands. So he was born, he says in verse 3, in Tarsus, but was brought up in the city, in the city at the feet of Gamaliel. My Jewish credentials are without question. I was taught the law, he's saying. I belong to Israel's most conservative denominations. Now remember... During that day, there were two major denominations in Israel. There were the Sadducees and there were the Pharisees. The Sadducees had been influenced by Greek philosophy, Greek thinking. But the Pharisees were the separated ones. The word Pharisee speaks of the separated one. So they were the ultra-conservative, and that's what he's saying. I was a Pharisee. Later on in chapter 26, he says... At verse 5, according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. In Philippians, when he's sharing his testimony again, in chapter 3, verse 5, he says he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee. And when you said that, you were really laying your credentials out. And Gamaliel, highly respected Pharisee, he's identifying in this way. And so he says in verse 3, I was zealous for God as you all are today. Now notice this, he doesn't accuse them of being without God. He accuses them of being zealous. When you're sharing with people and you discover their religious background, what it may be, whatever it may be, they tell you I'm a this or I'm a that. You might have a desire to just jump in it and tell them all the things that are wrong with that particular denomination. There are quite a number of, of people who do that. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and when my friend Bill got saved, he felt it was a good thing for him to attack the things that I had been taught, and it just didn't open the door for me 
because I, I, I got angry at him. Why are you attacking me? Why are you attacking the things that I've been taught? I didn't like it. And so we have to be careful in how you approach things and you share it. What you're wanting is people to know Jesus. That's what you're wanting. So he's saying, I was zealous for God as you all are today. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not saying that you're without God. What I'm saying is you're very zealous. But I was too. I was so zealous that I hunted down Christians because they were heretics. Now, in the New Testament, you might find this interesting. Perhaps I've already shared this or you've heard this in other studies. But in the New Testament, Gentiles are referred to as those without God. Those without God. In Ephesians 2 verse 12, when Paul was speaking to the Gentiles of Ephesus, he said, at that time... You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So the Gentiles were referred to as being without God. They were idolaters, separated from God. But the Jews are referred to as having a zeal for God, but without knowledge. When he was writing to the Romans in chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, he said this, he said, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So the Jews are referred to as having a zeal for God, but without knowledge. And that's why he's so zealous to proclaim Christ. And he speaks about this, verse 4, he said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders from, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were, were there to Jerusalem to be punished. And he continues by saying, I was a persecutor of this way. When he says, I was a persecutor of the way, well, this way is, is the way of Christ. It speaks about uh, the Christian faith, how Jesus is the truth. He's the way. He is eternal life. And so he's making it very clear that, that his religious zeal prompted him to persecute believers. He believed that they were heretics and they needed to be dealt with. In Galatians 1.13, he said, You heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. He believed their heresy was worthy of capital punishment. Again, in chapter 26, verse 10, that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So Paul is saying, listen, as, as, as you have taken me and I have been taken and beaten, as you wanted to do that to me, I have done the same. I have done that to others. He said in verse 5, the high priest can bear witness. Now, the high priest who was reigning at that time is not the same high priest who had known of his, his efforts previous. This is a different high priest, but this new high priest would have been aware of what Paul's life was like, as was the council. And so he's speaking in this way, and in verse 6 continues and says, It happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and, and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He gives the time that this happened and the location. He came near Damascus. Suddenly, it was about noon, a great light shone around him. Notice how he remembers, you might want to mark this, notice how he remembers when he came to faith in Christ. Now, there are, there are those who have been raised in the church and perhaps just will say, you know, I, I honestly can't give you a particular day because I was raised in the faith of Christ at a certain point, I knew for certain that I had a relationship with him. But there are others who can tell you the exact day. For me, December 27, 1970. I can tell you that day that my darkness was turned into light. 
And he's able to say that too. He's able to say that this happened at this time. And notice in verse 9, he says, those who, who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. I want to point something out here. They saw the light, they were afraid, they didn't hear the voice. Now what he's doing is he's referring to witnesses who can substantiate his claim as an actual truth. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, it says, One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they, they may have committed, or a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so he's using these as witnesses who can speak on what had happened and, and give a testimony concerning that. Now, at first glance, this could seem to contradict something we had seen in chapter 9, because in chapter 9, when the event was, was written for us to read and to study, in Acts chapter 9, verse 7, it says very clearly, the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice and seeing no one. So one verse says they heard a voice, the other says they did not hear the voice. So the question is, is this a contradiction in Scripture? We are, we are told as believers very often that while well, your Bible is filled with contradictions, perhaps some of you who have taken the time to share have had somebody say that to you. That the Bible's full of contradictions. Well, most of the time, all you need to do is hand them the Bible and ask them to show you one. Because normally they, they can't. Because they're simply repeating something they heard in, in one of the classes in school or by, you know, in discussion with friends. Oh, it's filled with contradictions. Well, Normally you can do that, but is this a contradiction? Uh, no, let me share something very briefly with you. Again, one verse says they heard a voice, the other says they didn't hear the voice. The word hear, the word hear in the Greek language means to comprehend or to understand. In other words, they did not understand what was being said. That's when he's saying that they heard the voice, but saw no one. They heard but did not comprehend. Well, why would you say that? Well, one, the word means to understand or comprehend. That's what it means. But two, we have a, a, another example of hearing but not understanding in John 12, 27 through 29. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. They heard but did not understand. And so that's the word that's being used here. They heard but did not understand. Well, it says, uh, verse 10, so I said, what shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, Arise, go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. In other words, the glory of the Lord temporarily had blinded him. Verse 12, Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and... He stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. And then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling the name on the name of the Lord. And so he speaks to him, and notice how Ananias is referred to in verse 12 as a devout man, and he had a good testimony. That means that he's establishing his, his credibility by calling on this man's reputation. And so verse 13 says, he came to me, and he stood and said, receive your sight. So he's saying, I was healed, I received my sight, the foundation has been laid, I began to preach. And then he goes on in verses 14 and 15 and speaks concerning the, uh, the ministry he's received. And what is it to be? A witness, notice, to all men. That's an important point. We'll be looking at that in just a second. Now, I'll, I'll touch something with you real quickly. Verse 16, 
Why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, let me touch that for a minute. Is this saying that your sins are washed away by water baptism? No. Why is that? Well, because baptism is an act of obedience, but it is not something that saved you. You're not saved by being water baptized. In 1 Peter 3.21 Water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a betrayal of death, burial, and resurrection. That's the point. You've identified that the one who died on behalf of you was raised from the dead, who now gives you life. When you're water baptized, the old man is dead, and you have a newness of life in Christ. That's the picture that you have. Why? Because even if it's a, it's a very uh, special and religious thing to do, it isn't what is saving you. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So salvation results from faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, and not by works, lest any man should boast. So baptism is an act of obedience that results from salvation, not in salvation. It's, it's an outward demonstration of an internal faith. So as he's sharing in verse 17, it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I was in a trance and, and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get, to, get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your, your martyr Stephen was, was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death, guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So he begins to share concerning these things. He says, when I return, verse 17, to Jerusalem. He was praying in the temple. This would have occurred a few years later. Uh, I was there in the temple. It's pointing out that he didn't dishonor the temple. He still honored it. And he says, I was in a trance. The Lord spoke to me. By sharing this with them, it makes it clear his mission is ordained by God. It reminds them of the vision that Isaiah in chapter 6 had had when it says in Isaiah 6, 8 through 10, uh, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I, I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go, tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. So the narrative implies that Jesus appeared to him in the temple in a vision and gave him a special command. He used to go to the Gentiles, even though the Jewish people who are to receive the word are rejecting it. Now it goes on to say, and we'll move towards our conclusion. Verse 19, pick it up at verse 19. When the blood of martyrs Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death, guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. He said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Up to that point, things were going okay. Surely the Lord changed me. You know that in every synagogue, I imprisoned people. I, I was consistent with the death of the first martyr. I was passionately in favor with it. And so he's speaking of his zeal and his Jewishness. But then when he says in verse 21, I will send you far from here to Gentiles, that was it. For him to say, I'm going to the Gentiles, well, that triggered the response. They listened, verse 22, until this word. Gentiles were not equal to Jews. Jews, in their mind, are the chosen people. When he said he went to the Gentiles, it outraged them. This, in their mind, is proving the charge that Paul brought a Gentile into 
the temple. What did they do as a response to that? Verse 23 says, they listened to him until this word. They raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from there. He is not fit to live. They cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against. They went crazy. They were so upset. They were preparing by tearing off the clothes, their cloaks. They were going to stone him. And when the, the commander sees this, he doesn't understand, so he, he has them brought into the barracks. We're going to have to discover what, what's happening. Why are they so upset? Verse 25, they bound him with thongs with leather straps. Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care of what you do, for this man's a Roman. The commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum, I obtained the citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. Immediately, those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he bound him. And the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds, commanded the chief priests and all their counsel to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. So he's being prepared for scourging, but he appeals to his rights as, as a citizen. You see, to scourge Paul in this way could result in the loss of the commander's life. So in the discussion, the commander says, well, I purchased citizenship, probably by a bribe. But Paul says, I was born a Roman citizen, and that carries much more weight. Now, as they're speaking about this, I want you to notice verse 29, immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. Why is that? They didn't want anything to do with this. You could almost see them this very slowly kind of moving back into the shadows and going out the door, leaving the commander there with Paul because they had violated Roman law in binding a citizen who had not been charged with the crime. So what he has to do now is he has to further examine him, and that's what we'll be seeing as we continue. But what is it we see as we conclude this portion of our study? Well, one, we see that Paul is a great example of a believer who's under trial. One, he accepts what is happening to him as being from the Lord. He had been prepared and he was ready. He knows that this is from the Lord too. He used his circumstances as his opportunity. So even though he knew where he was going and, and things were about to get even worse, he was still faithful to preach the word of God, which is why he had come to Jerusalem. And finally, even when he had been unjustly taken in this fashion, he didn't respond with threats, but he did make use of his proper rights, which is what we even at this day do. When people will say, and they are doing it much more now, it's just, it's not even hidden anymore, this antagonism to the gospel. You need to be quiet. You can't congregate. And if you do congregate, you can't do it indoors. And if you congregate outside, you can't sing. And if you're there outside, not singing, then you have to have six feet between you. Now, that is unless you're getting a tattoo. If you're getting a tattoo, that's okay. Or that is unless you're going to a strip club. Because if you're going to a strip club, that's really okay. Well, that is unless you're gathering uh, in a protest. Because if you're gathering in a protest with no mask, that's still okay. But you Christians, you need to keep your mouth shut. You Christians, you cannot congregate on Sunday. You Christians, you can't sing. You Christians cannot have fellowship. You Christians need to be isolated. If you didn't see that was taking place, let me remind you that it did. And so what did we do? We didn't sh shake our fist in the, in the face of the government. People wanted to gather, and we gathered. Amen. 
We gave you a little separation to give you a little comfort. We didn't want to be stupid, but at the same time, we don't bow our knee to Caesar. We bow our knee to Christ. And, and Paul was doing that. Paul was making use of the rights he has as a citizen. And that is never inappropriate. It's the attitudes that we have. It's a, it's a pugnaciousness and belligerence that sometimes we can have. What we need to do is, is just follow the Lord and do the best that we can. And to be as honest as we can, as loving as we can, as compassionate as we can, as caring as we can, the best citizens that we can be. But if you're telling me I can't worship the Lord Jesus Christ, you've crossed the line. I will worship Jesus Christ. That's what you do. And Paul was doing that. He used his rights so he could proclaim the message that sets people free. We need to be aware of that ourselves. And use the rights that God gave to you, not pugnaciously and belligerently, but properly exercise those rights and take the opportunity. Because if there's anything this nation needs now, it's revival. And the church has to first be revived to ignite the world to come to faith in Christ. Exercise your rights. Do it properly. Do it with respect. But exercise your rights. You have them for a reason.